Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our very first Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative event of 2021. I'm Beverly Kirk. I direct the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative here at CSIS, and I'm a fellow in the International Security Program. And normally, you would be welcomed by our former director, Dr. Kathleen Hicks, who was just last night confirmed as the Deputy Defense Secretary. So congratulations to her, and thanks to her for all she did to get this project up and running. Well, we are very pleased today to welcome Kathy Warden, CEO of Northrop Grumman, for a conversation about defense in the 21st century. Nina Easton, CSIS Senior Associate and Co-CEO of Sellers Easton Media, will moderate today's discussion. Also, be sure to mark your calendars for our very next Smart Women, Smart Power event, which is coming up on March 8th to celebrate International Women's Day. Our speaker will be Gail Lamont. She is the author of the soon-to-be-released book, Daughters of Kobani, which tells the story of Kurdish women in Northeast Syria who fought off ISIS. You will not want to miss this program coming up on March 8th. The Smart Women, Smart Power speaker series is possible thanks to our founding partner, City, and we are very grateful for City's con continued support now in our sixth year. It's my pleasure to welcome Kristen Solheim, Director, Federal Government Affairs at City, for remarks. Kristen? Thank you, Deb, and good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us for this first online series of 2021. This is our sixth year of supporting this um, outstanding series dedicated to women and national security. And um, it's, a, it's a true honor to be here this morning. It's hard to believe it's been a year since we've gathered in person. I can't even believe that we're saying this, but we've all adjusted and found ways to keep it going. And this is a testament to all of, all of your interest and work in um, making this series possible. And the um, number of people participating today is certainly heartening. And I echo what Bev said about Dr. Hicks and um, her historic uh, confirmation last night. That's so exciting and the perfect lead in for today's uh, speaker. At City, we call ourselves the leading global bank because we're present in almost 100 countries, which gives us a, a unique ability to have to see what's happening around the world and the challenges and opportunities that this um, the, the most recent years have presented us. Um, it's a thrill that more than 200 of my city colleagues from around the world, from Mexico to the UK, Nigeria, Japan, are all joining us online, um, which I think is one of those silver linings to being in the pandemic is that we can gather online in immense numbers that were never possible before. Um, I know Kathy Warden must have a global perspective in her very fascinating job, and I can't wait to hear more about that. So I'll kick it over to Nina to get us started. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Kristen, and thank you to City. I can't believe it's been six years uh, since we founded Smart Women, Smart Power, and I also want to congratulate Kath Hicks as Deputy Defense Secretary. What a moment, and uh, congratulations to her. Uh, I also want to remind everybody who follows our program to listen to the podcast, which Bev Kirk hosts. Smart Women, Smart Power is also a podcast as well as live events. So please join us for some of those important conversations. Um, and finally, I want to remind everybody that this is, as always, interactive. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to our guests, but I also want to make sure that you're all involved and have a chance to offer your own questions. So you can go on the website and do that. So Kathy Warden, welcome. Um, it's such an honor to have you here today. Thank you, Nina. It's wonderful to be with you. You became CEO and president starting in January of 2019, which 
if we do a little math, we find that uh, that's just a little over a year um, before the pandemic, a global pandemic uh, descended on the, the globe. What have been the leadership lessons that you've had to either learn or apply in moving really fast to cope with this? Well, it certainly was an early reminder in my CEO tenure that you have to be prepared for anything. And the things that you aren't prepared for, you need to react to quickly. And so the pandemic, it really, for all industries, was a change moment that you could have anticipated only in a very surreal way. Uh, I, I'm sure all companies had pandemics or health events as a risk that they understood could happen, but very few believed it would happen in the time horizon that it did for all of us in 2020. And so from a leadership perspective, we had to adapt extremely quickly. The first issue was recognizing that the pandemic was going to change the way we worked, and not just for a few days or a few weeks, but here we are a year later. The second thing that we had to do is keep our employee safety at the forefront of every decision we were making. And that meant we had to change the way we were doing work. Some people needed to work from home so that we could focus our attention on the people who had to come to our facilities to get their work done. And that was a massive undertaking to give them the tools that they needed to do their job remotely. And then for the employees who needed to come into our facilities to do their work, and many do because of either the secure nature of their work or because they're working on a manufacturing line, those employees, we had to figure out how to six feet distant. We had to make sure that they had the equipment they needed, like masks. We had to make sure that they understood when to stay home and not come to work if they were feeling any symptoms. It was a massive change effort within the company. It took communication and it took the entire team working together. And I'm really proud of how not only the Northrop Grumman team stepped up, but the entire aerospace and defense industry worked together. And you know, it this pandemic is one of those uh, black swans on the horizon that people talked about, but came as a surprise. Uh, it descended quickly and remorselessly. Um, and it raises the question for leaders in the defense industry, does the United States have the defense industry it needs looking forward and looking at the potential for other black swans? It's certainly a wake up call, not only for our company resiliency, but our supply chain resiliency. Do we have suppliers around the globe who can adapt quickly to a situation like the pandemic presented for us? And if we don't, what are the steps that we need to take to help that supply chain be more durable and be more resilient? And the industry is working together on that very question and I know this will be a key issue for the Biden administration as the new leaders of the Department of Defense step in at this time, looking at the resiliency of the industrial base will be key questions. And more importantly, defining some of the mitigation steps that we have to take together. And this really needs to be a government and industry partnership to shore up the broader ecosystem of the defense industrial base. We will be seeing activity on that uh, coming up in the next couple of months. Uh, and will you be playing your leadership role? We will see activity on this in the next few months, and the Aerospace Industries Association in particular, of which I happen to be chair this year, is taking this very issue under not only uh, a set of recommendations that we can take forward to the administration, but also work across the industrial base that we can do together through the association. And I will say I'm very proud of the collaboration that's happened across the industry already. 
the larger corporations who had the financial means to keep operating and to take the safety measures that I spoke of, very proactively reached out to smaller and mid-sized companies to help give them the information they needed about how to change their protocols to continue to operate. And in addition, we flowed funds to them and the resources that they needed to have the cash on hand to be able to continue to operate during the pandemic. So these are just a couple of examples how our industry pulled together. You hear many examples, like in the pharmaceutical industry, how the companies were Work together to make such rapid progress on the vaccine. And I hope that this is something that industries can really bottle and hold on to as we move forward post-pandemic. It makes you wonder how worried we should have been about national security during the pandemic. It does, and many companies recognized that, in particular, their cyber attack surface was expanded greatly during the pandemic, with so many colleagues working from home, and they needed to put additional emphasis into cybersecurity risk management. That's just one example, but it's a, a very clear one of a learning that came out of the pandemic about security and the importance of security, not just as a government, issue to, to manage and the national security landscape that we think of as a governmental function, but the role industry plays as well. Let's talk about cybersecurity. I mean, you came out of, uh, you, you're a cybersecurity expert. That, that was your field. Talk about the threats that you are most concerned about. And also, I mean, we're not, we're not gonna stop being remote for a while. Um, how does that contribute to the cyber threat that we're all facing in the United States? Well, from a cyber perspective, what we've often found is that adversaries take time of distraction as an opportunity. And so we have seen an increase in adversary activity in the cyber domain over the last year as companies, governments have been working to address the pandemic that thought that we would take our eye off the ball. And I have to say that that is not the case. What I have seen is that companies have really adapted quite quickly to understand that the cyber threat surface has expanded and that they need to apply more resource to protecting uh, themselves. And yet this is a very rapidly evolving area. As much as a company can take action today that makes them feel very secure in the defense posture that they've put in place, the adversaries are innovating at that rapid pace such that a week from now, two weeks from now, there will be a new threat vector, a new vulnerability. And so this is not a race that can ever be won. It's one that has to be continually focused on. And that's why working together, government and industry collaboration and industry to industry collaboration is so important in the cybersecurity arena. Yeah, and we've of course heard about the uh, mass uh, hack that we uh, that intelligence officials believe came from Russia. Can you talk about that and also talk about in the next couple of years how the cyber threat, the nature of it will evolve? What, what should we be looking for? We've seen that the th cyber threat has evolved to more and more sophisticated points of access. So it, it, traditionally, companies thought of an external or perimeter defense, and that was going to keep adversaries out. I think over time, what all large entities have learned is that even with the most sophisticated cyber defense forces and monitoring in place, New vulnerabilities are created at such a rapid rate that you can't plan on keeping the adversary out of your network. So you have to protect the internal environment as well. And that's really how the evolution has taken us to not just focus on defense as a perimeter, but instead protecting the things that are most critical to the organization. That's data. That's people. 
that's assets and knowing what those most important things are and then building higher walls around those, better defenses around those is how the state of uh, cyber protection has evolved in recent years. And I expect that will continue to be the focus as we move forward. So let me ask you briefly, and we, I know we have a lot of territory to cover, but you're, um, um, Northrop Grumman has, is system coordinator for the U.S. CyberCom Unified Platform. Can you just briefly explain what that is and what, what the role is in moving forward? Yes. So for Cyber Command, we provide the tools that our cyber warriors need to operate in cyberspace. It's called a platform because it isn't a single system. It is a way to visualize the cyber domain and then operate within it. Tools for both defensive and offensive activity in the cyber domain. And this is very relevant to what I was just speaking about, that this is a constant back and forth between operating in the space to actively defend and to gain intelligence and situational awareness that need to inform that defense. Talk about other new kinds of threats like um, the militarization of space, um, uh, anti-satellite weaponry, Tell us what we should be concerned most about. At a macro level, the fact that many more nations today have the ability to operate in space and to weaponize space is what we should be concerned about. Even a decade ago, space was viewed as a safe haven. Assets in space could operate freely without real concern of those assets being at danger. And today that's not the case. And not just one or two nations, but many nations are demonstrating the capability to both operate in space, but also have anti-satellite uh, capability. And so what we need to focus on then is putting all the norms and the technologies in place that allow us to have freedom of operation in the space domain, just as we would want in the air domain, the land or of the seas. And that's why you see a significant amount of focus and expenditure on recapitalizing the assets that the US and our allies have in space. So what should the Biden administration be doing in terms of this threat? Well, one of the steps that the Trump administration took in standing up the Space Force was to put in place a set of control and command structures for space as a domain, and also to create the ability to build a space cadre of military and civilian experts. These are important steps. And regardless of whether the Biden administration continues forward with the Trump plan and structure, it is important that the nation have this focus on space as a domain and builds the talent that's necessary to both lead, operate, and acquire systems for space. What is your thinking about where military spending will be going under the Biden administration? And what's your message to the White House? Well, the general view is that national security will continue to be a focus in the Biden administration. And that while budgets may flatten from where they had been uh, with annual increases more in the mid single digit range, that that focus within a flat budget will shift more to research and development and staying at the forefront of technology. And these are important areas for our nation to be focused on. Things like the future of computing, microelectronics, the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in a responsible way for national security purposes, or the advanced networking that is required to tie our systems together. These are all areas that the Biden administration has spoken about as priorities for research and development that will keep us at the forefront of technology across a wide range of weapon systems and domains. So Kathy, we started this conversation talking about black swans. And in fact, your uh, career trajectory was very deeply affected by a black swan, which we call 9-11.
can you talk about how that attack on our homeland had an impact on your own career? I can. I was working in commercial technology at the time and envisioned myself just continuing on that career trajectory. I was in an organization that also did work with the federal government, and I was asked to come and lead a business in aerospace and defense. And I thought this was a temporary uh, assignment that I would do my civic duty and come into the industry while I could have an impact. This was following the 9-11 Commission and the focus on information sharing. One of the key elements of focus in the technology company that I was a part of was the the information sharing uh, domain. And I really found that I didn't want to leave because my work had greater purpose in this industry than it had ever had before. And so I chose to stay in the industry. Yeah, describe that sense of purpose. I really, in this industry, feel like I am working toward a safer environment for the next generation. And I know some people look at the aerospace and defense industry, and defense in particular, and think of it as an industry that will want to see conflict. I say that couldn't be further from the truth. What we do is create the capabilities that allow for diplomacy and that encourage diplomacy over conflict and that project peace, not war. And so that's very much uh, how I see the role of this industry and what I want to as a citizen play a small part in. So you grew up and we, when we, before you got on and you got on um, the screen when we were talking about this, you were, you grew up in Smithburg, Maryland. And I was surprised I, as a Marylander, didn't even know where it was. It's a small town. Um, tell us about your, your growing up. And I, I believe you were the first in your family to go to college. My sister and I, my sister's older, so technically she was the first, but we were first generation college students. And my parents raised us to be focused on hard work and uh, just creating a better environment for our kids than they were able to provide for us and so on. And so it really created a foundation that I believe does translate into why this industry has been appealing to me and why I've wanted to do something with my life that I can feel proud of. and. Uh, passed to my children. But Smithsburg is a very small town. I'm not at all surprised that you hadn't heard about it. And I was so excited to get out and explore the world. But the truth is, I'm only about an hour and 15 minutes from where I grew up. So I've done a lot of exploration, but I'm not too far from, from home. And did you have this lofty ambitions when you were growing up in Smithsburg? Did you expect you'd be a CEO one day? No, I didn't. And, you know, to be honest, as I progressed through my career, for me, it was never about the level I would attain. It was more about having an impact and feeling proud of the work that I was doing. And so I feel blessed to be a CEO and to lead this fantastic team. But I realized that it really is an honor. It's it's nothing that I ever would have expected, nor am I in any way entitled to now that I hold the the role. You know, it's important that as a leader, I earn every day the respect of our shareholders, our board, and most importantly, our customers and our employees. So Kathy, we started Smart Women, Smart Power six years ago to, um, to amplify the voices of women in national security and foreign affairs. And when you were appointed CEO and president in 2019, there are actually three women running major aerospace companies. Now there's two. Uh, Marilyn Houston has stepped down, but what is what kind of advice do you have for the women listening to this today who want to follow a similar path of your like yours that is both dedicated to purpose, um, but also uh, becoming a leader of a major organization? 
My first advice is that you would always follow your own path, that it's impossible to recreate someone else's. And the way you follow your own path, in my experience, is being open to opportunities, even when they don't necessarily look like opportunities to you. They, they don't come in the package that you expected or exactly at the time frame that you wanted them to. You need to be open to them. And in particular, I found that when I took the assignments that other people showed away from or thought, that seems awfully risky. Those were actually the assignments that helped me to grow the most and where the organization respected that I would step out and I would try something that was tough or a stretch. And so don't be afraid of taking a little bit of risk in your career and doing what seems uncomfortable. Be confident in yourself that you'll develop the skills needed to continue to thrive and succeed. So the defense and aerospace industry that you, you're helping lead today is not just about uh, national security and uh, protecting our borders. It is also about space exploration increasingly. And to me, one of the coolest projects that you're helping to run is the Webb Telescope, which will be uh, the successor, I guess, to the, the Hubble Telescope, uh, potentially launching in fall, cross fingers. You can talk about that. It, it's described as revolutionary, going out a million miles and looking back 13.5 billion years, I believe. Why is this so revolutionary? What Tell us about this telescope. Well, it's amazing when you get that far from Earth and you're able to look back, you're, you're basically looking back in time, as, as you just said, and we will see what the origins of the universe looked like around the time of the Big Bang. And that's going to enhance our understanding of science. It's in impossible to imagine that we can develop technology that allows us to rewrite science books, to basically redefine what we understand about history and how the universe was formed. But that's indeed what the James Webb Telescope is going to allow us to do. It's been a long time in the making. Uh, we often talk about the James Webb Space Telescope as having 14 inventions. We had to invent 14 technologies to be able to make this system work and meet its requirements. And so we're very proud of that. At the core, Northrop Grumman is a technology company. We operate in the aerospace and defense industry, but we invent and innovate technology on a daily basis. And that's what gets our engineering workforce so excited to get up and come to work each day. So walk us through the timeline from, from fall on fall and if there's a launch, and then when when do we start getting the data from the telescope? So it does take a while for the telescope to get to its final place, a million miles from Earth. And then we have some work that we need to do just to unfold the telescope. It doesn't travel in its configuration for data collection. So we will literally unfold the, the shield that goes around the very sensitive optics that allow us to take the pictures that will come back uh, to us here on Earth. And that takes some time. We'll do calibration and check out, and then we should be producing data uh, early next year. So it's very exciting. Early next year. Wow. Okay. That's when, when you were first talking, I thought it was years. Okay. Early next year. That's good. Months. Well, it, it, we will be collecting data as it traverses from its launch all the way to that destination. And then the science will come after uh, we get through all of those checkouts that I mentioned. But it's amazing to see the progress uh, that we've made in space technologies. Has anyone said to you, I mean, are we going to, I know we're going to understand the world differently. Are we going to view it differently? Are we going to view the universe differently in some way? What, what's your sense of how it's going to change our perspective on being on planet Earth and in our lives in this universe? Well, we certainly hope that there will be discoveries that change our perspective about our place in the universe. Uh, but all of that today is just speculation. 
because we have never been able to get this kind of intelligence about our universe. And so absolutely discovery is the purpose of putting this phenomenal asset in space so that our children will know so much more about this universe than we did. And hopefully that creates a spark of interest and further desire for exploration of space and the ability for us to look at space as another domain for opportunity. Because as we all know, the resources on this planet are so valuable to us, but they are not the limitation of what we as mankind can explore. Right. So I'm going to start asking some questions from our audience. And just a reminder to everybody, uh, go on the website and you can submit questions and we're happy to answer them or ask them, excuse me. Um, this is from Laura at Halifax International Security Forum. The Biden administration is calling for a summit for democracies to meet threats from China, Russia, and beyond. What role do you see the U.S.-based aerospace industry leaders like Northrop Grumman playing in this effort? Well, as I noted, the aerospace and defense industry plays a key role in offering options to any administration to both support diplomacy as well as to work in conjunction with our allies toward joint programs. There are many great examples of that. Probably the largest is the F-35, where we have dozens of partner nations working together with the U.S. for the development of that system. And then we will all uh, be able to field the system and have it work in a way that is interoperable. This is you know, certainly not just an aid to diplomacy, but it is an aid to the interoperation of allied nations when we do find ourselves engaging in conflict together. And so what we see ourselves doing is providing that optionality through the systems that we build and deliver. The administration will work to define what are the options they need, how do they want to engage with our allies, and what are the capabilities they need to work uh, to contain our adversaries. So to follow up on that, last fall, um, you were awarded the contract to build the U.S. Air Force's next generation of ICBM. Um, could you explain the evolving role of that system in our defense strategy? So that is one leg of our nuclear deterrent system. And there are three legs to what is called the triad. And the point of the deterrence is just what it says. These are not systems that are built with the intention of needing to deploy them. They are built to keep any adversary who may think that they would want to engage the US or one of our allies in conflict, particularly of a nuclear nature, being unwilling to take that step because they recognize the nation has the capability to retaliate. So the triad is very important in keeping the peace as I spoke to earlier. The ground leg of the triad is the most resilient of the three legs of the triad because it has many missile silos that are spread in different parts of the United States. And in its nature is resilient because it has these many points uh, of attack surface that would need to be eliminated to take out the ground-based triad or ground-based leg of the triad. So we see this part of the triad as the most, uh, as I said, both resilient and one of the most important of the three legs in providing optionality for this administration and future administrations. It's important to note that this leg has been in place for about 50 years and the modernization program that we're executing would provide the capability for the next 50. So as we continue with overall nuclear modernization, um, I'd like to get your personal perspective on curbing nuclear pro proliferation. We just lost George Schultz. I had the honor of um, speaking with him not that long ago about the need to um, 
to, uh, he believed, get rid of nuclear weapons altogether. Um, what do you think are the important next steps to curb a nuclear threat, even if you're, as you pursue modernizing our defenses? Well, let me first also comment on having tremendous respect for George. And I had the pleasure of spending some time with him a year and a half ago. And what an amazing statesman and really visionary he is. I would reflect on the thought that the best deterrent is having the capability to keep others from advancing their weapons system capability. And so the removal of nuclear weapons now that they are in the arsenal of multiple nations is likely not a near-term objective that can be met. Instead now, it is about containment. And we have the systems in place that we have because they have successfully contained nuclear proliferation. And it's hard for anyone to say what would happen or what would have happened had we not had ICBMs over the last 50 years. But lots of very smart statesmen, military personnel, and civilians alike have studied this through multiple nuclear posture reviews and come out believing that the best posture for our nation is continuing to move forward with the modernization of all three legs of our triad. So let's move on to another uh major global issue, and that's climate change. Um, this is a question from Lisa, who uh, describes herself as a communications professional. What challenges and opportunities do you see for the defense industry to address climate change? The defense industry is already playing a role in addressing climate change, most notably with the work we're doing in surveillance that help us to understand the changing environment related to increases in temperature, particularly in the polar regions. We also are involved in natural disaster response, as well as understanding the evolution of things like hurricanes through the systems that we build that are mainly for surveillance and have both military application and surveillance, but now can be used to assess fires and the spread and collect important information that helps firefighters to address those. All of these are climate-related uh, disasters that were involved in helping to either prevent or in most cases reduce damage or respond. So these are a few things that the industry already is involved in. As we move forward, I believe that the industry has an opportunity to also look at our own products and be responsible in the way that we develop products so that we aren't contributing to climate impact. Uh, our company has a number of goals that we tie as part of our incentive compensation for executives to greenhouse gas emission reduction, as well as water conservation and solid waste disposal. These are just a few steps that we're taking on a pathway to net zero emissions, which all companies should be putting plans in place to address. Kathy, yes, what about space exploration and generally? Do you see opportunities there to um, you know, find assistance, shall we say, on climate change issues? Well, certainly we have a bird's eye view from space on some of the issues that I just mentioned to understand the impacts of climate change on the globe and be able to better inform about those impacts of climate change. Uh, I haven't really explored the idea of how space exploration or surveillance can assist with the climate impacts on uh, planet Earth. It was certainly, we look more to our work in the undersea domain uh, as well as the airborne domain today as major ways to contribute to the health of the climate. So this question is from Julia, an NYU student. As a STEM student with an interest in cybersecurity defense, how can I make connections with professionals, especially women in the field, 
who might be able to advise me when everything is online. Mediation over LinkedIn can feel so impersonal. Do you have any guidance on more engaging uh, ways to network online? Well, it is true that right now the ability to network is somewhat limited by the fact that we are doing most engagement online. But I will also tell you that most people have a little more time to engage in getting out and speaking with groups because for instance, this, I walked down the hall, I was able to sit across from Nina, have this conversation with hundreds of people. And had I done this in a live forum, it would have taken a half my day and in half Nina's day as well. So we're able to do a lot more engagement right now. So look for those opportunities to uh, engage. And it may not be a bi-directional engagement, but by tuning in and listening, you get to understand a little bit about the people that are speaking to you. And then you can follow up with direct communications later. And I, just on that point, don't hesitate to reach out to people who you think are too busy, may not have the time for me. You may be right, they may not respond, but you may be wrong and you may get fortunate and start a relationship or get some information that you wouldn't have otherwise gotten if you didn't just try. So I would encourage everyone to have confidence, put yourself out there, and that's exactly what often gets relationships started. Is there a moment that built confidence in you uh, that just made you realize that you could do this? You know, the year that I made my career transition that we spoke about, uh, 2001, was also a year that I had my first son. I lost my father. My whole world in the course of three months felt like it had been turned upside down, including for those of you who experienced 9-11-2001, maybe not in as personal a way as I did, but you can reflect on how the country felt in that moment, just a change in how we felt about our personal safety and security and the future of the nation. And I'm so pleased sitting here 20 years later to say, you know, the nation built back from that point, but it was a very low point. And I was thinking very much about what my future would hold. And I, like many, uh, was a little bit um, concerned and afraid. And I think what I learned from that whole experience was you can either be defeated by the things that happen around you or you can persevere through them. And the latter is much better. It gives you a sense of, of control. It gives you a sense of being able to emerge uh, stronger. And so that's probably where some confidence came from at a point in my life and my career when it was really timely. So where were you that day? Did, were you just the mother of an infant at home or what, where were you? You know, it was, I had returned to work off of maternity leave the week prior and I was driving into work later than usual because I had dropped my son off uh, at daycare, which was a really hard thing to do. You know, it was only my sixth day of, of doing that. And so I was figuring out how to juggle career and being a new mom and getting a new routine. And so I had a million things on my mind. And I remember driving down the highway and hearing about the first plane crash into the World Trade Centers and just having this sense of disbelief but I also was running a business that had people in the facility next to the Twin Towers. And so I immediately had to hop into action, thinking about their safety, reaching out to the office lead, and you know, much like we described with the pandemic, but a much more sense of urgency that morning. And it, it really defined how I then needed to start thinking about balancing work and life. You know, this was real time happening, the two things colliding. And how, how did they 
manage through it? How did they do? So, yeah, so all of our team in New York was safe. Many of them were either in the on the ferry on the way over or uh, in the building next door, but evacuated. They were obviously traumatized as much of New York City and, and the surrounding suburbs were by the events of that day. It took us a while to recuperate. And many of our clients who were banks in the financial district of New York suffered great loss, both people and property, and were going through recovery. So it was the beginning of a bit of a downturn in our business, which is what led uh, me to make the shift over into the intelligence work immediately thereafter. So you really felt this personally as a leader and a new mom in, in lots of ways that hit you hit home. Um, we have a question from apparently someone who works for you, Sean Brown, Northrop Grumman. As a father to two young girls, what advice or guidance would you have wanted to hear when you were young, knowing the opportunities and challenges that awaited you as you entered the workforce? Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful question. And one of the things that I would have loved to hear is the importance of science and technology, engineering and math, and the encouragement that as a young woman, it was not uncool to study science and math, and that you know it was a set of skills that would serve me well for a lifetime. I remember I remember thinking multiple times, and I've spoken to many women who uh, unfortunately had the same experience, stepped out of an advanced science or math track because they just didn't think that it was something appropriate for them to study or that they couldn't compete. And that's just not not the case. Some of our bo our best technical uh, resources are women, and it's important to have that foundation. I'd say the other thing is one that I already said: take risk, um, and and don't be afraid. So this is a bit of breaking news from um, Megan at City. What are your thoughts? It was just announced a few minutes ago that the UAE is expected to create the first full map of the Martian atmosphere. Um, I, I feel free to answer that if you if you if you feel it like it. Well, I think it's wonderful that so many nations now have aspirations in space exploration. I believe in globalization of defense industry growing around the world. The aerospace industry growing around the world will just make the entire industry stronger. There are many new entrants, particularly in space, and not all of them, uh, maybe not even the majority of them in the US. And that that's going to make us all uh, just that much more competitive, that much more capable. And I think it's fantastic. And I feel the same way about nations who are working to explore and increase their expenditure in both defense, aerospace, and space. So this is another, um, this question from Norden, who's the, from the Embassy of Algeria in Canada. Um, I guess drawing on your uh, intel and cybersecurity background, do you think the unexpected outbreak of the COVID-19 is the biggest failure of the intelligence community? Um, it is interesting to look at that, the pandemic as an intelligence um, and national security issue. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I certainly see pandemics as a national security issue. I don't, however, necessarily see this as a failure of the intelligence community. I, perhaps it's because I've worked now for more than 20 years with the intelligence community, and I know the passion and the dedication of the professionals in that uh, workforce. Look, there's a tremendous amount of information to monitor around the globe. And to be able to pick the needles out of a haystack that in hindsight, 
seem so obvious and so connected, but to do that proactively, to see what was happening in Wuhan and be able to knit that together and understand how it might proliferate would have been a yeoman's task for, for any uh, organization. And so I have tremendous respect for our intelligence community and the work they do. And I know so much of what they have successfully identified and been able to address uh, as risks that never materialized, that I certainly wouldn't put this as a failure on their part. So this is from Margaret at Serve USA. In speaking of talent management and workforce development, is there an opportunity for our nation to incorporate national service, utilizing military training programs for both military and civilians to build up our capability in cyber and other functional areas used by aerospace industries. And, and she sets as an example, the Israeli cyber programs, which were greatly enhanced by their national service program. But it's certainly an interesting concept. And what we have done is exchange resources between industry and government. We arguably could do that at greater scale. And a national service program creates the structure in order to do that and has some real merit as a result. Because there are some issues as you work to exchange resources between industry and government, not the least of which is you don't want to create conflicts of interest for the individuals who are spending some time working with government and then want to return to industry. You have different compensation and benefit models, all of which have to be worked out if you want to, at scale, have these uh, exchange programs. But there is no doubt that there is merit to understanding the role of government and being able to, particularly in cyber, sit in a seat of government where you have much broader authorities than you, you do in industry, and you, you certainly grow from the experience of working on both, both sides. So Kathy, before we, um, we have 10 minutes left, I did want to get into a threat that we didn't go deep into, and that's China. Um, can you just discuss your perspective on China as a military threat? We know it's an economic competitor, but let, let's talk look at it uh, through a military lens, and how do you think about it? Well, there's certainly no doubt that China has evolved in the last decade or so in its aspirations to both have more control over certain pathways, both for economic interest and national security interests, and that they are projecting power more across the globe than ever before through those, those efforts. And so when we look at what it takes to be able to operate in a peer competition, I would suggest that economic interests and national security interests are no longer two separate things. They can be viewed as independent of one another, but now have to be viewed as completely interrelated because resources are a form of being able to project power, uh, both through diplomacy, as I said, but in conflict as well. Well, and so there is no doubt that the U.S. in looking at China has to recognize that they have significantly increased their expenditure on defense. They have built up their weapon systems capability significantly and seem to be on a trajectory to continue to do so and are harnessing technology and information in ways that most other nations are neither capable of doing or resourced to do. And so these are what create a sense that the U.S. needs to look at China through a different lens as a national security threat today than we have in the past. So when you look at the defense industries kind of reconfiguring itself or moving towards threats five years out, 10 years out, threats that we've discussed that are layered on top of you know, existing um, threats and existing um, uh, configurations in the industry, when you layer on you know, space, the rise of actors like China, cyber, um, which obviously has been around for a while, but is evolving, as you say, how is the industry going to look different in five years out, 10 years out from them? 
I think it, two things will be different in the industry 10 years to 20 years out. One is the use of core technology to rapidly innovate new solution space. And that means there'll be more partnership, both partnership amongst industrial players, as well as partnership between governments to evolve technologies uh, more rapidly. And as a result, I believe the industry will look different in terms of its composition. There'll be more consolidation there will also be more new entrants. And so it's hard to say there will be fewer players, but the ones that exist today will likely continue to consolidate as we have seen in recent years and we've seen in other cycles uh, over the decades. But you'll also have new entrants, particularly in areas like cyber and space that are more rapidly growing and creating the, the room for more uh, new players. What about technologies like AI and machine learning? How is that going to shape the industry? Well, when I mentioned the utilization of advanced technologies, that's exactly what I'm speaking of. And these won't all be technologies that are invented for defense application. These will be technologies that are used for many commercial applications and now brought into the defense industry and specifically applied to problems that are unique to the surveillance, command and control, the, the issues of defense that aren't translatable into a commercial context. Well, Kathy, final question is from, um, from CSIS. Uh, can you please speak a little more about your purpose you referred to earlier, in particular, your vision around defense as a means of peace and diplomacy within your organization? This is obviously a question from the heart of CSIS. So. Um, Give us your thoughts as we come to a close. Well, our purpose at Northrop Grumman and my personal uh, affinity for that purpose is that we are working to enable global security and that's for all and human advancement. And again, that's for all people. And those are lofty goals, but I believe in working together with other companies, with nations, with our allies. These are goals that we all should aspire to. And that is about peace and prosperity for the human race. It's not about conflict and destruction. It's about working together to construct the environment that we all want to live in. Kathy, thank you so much for all of your insights and your perspective and your big picture and your optimism moving forward. It's been really wonderful to have you. Thank you, Nina. I enjoyed our conversation very much.